everybody. Thanks for joining another exciting episode of the OpenShift Commons briefings. Today, we are very fortunate to have Mark Borstein and Brian Culhane join us here from Tremolo Security. We're going to be talking about how to securely automate GitOps. Mark, welcome to the show. I have seen you at just about every major trade show for the last these four or five years. You've been at, at our OpenShift Commons activities. You've been at the OpenShift Summit activities. You've been engaged with us on just about just about everything we ever do, webcasts, podcasts, videos. But I've never actually asked you, like, Tremolo Security. Is it Tremolo Security? Is it Tremolo Security? What, what, what's, what's in the name? So um, it's pronounced Tremolo kind of a L, E L sound there after the M. Uh, so a, a tremolo is a sound fluctuation. So uh, if you have ever um, uh, played guitar or even the organs, uh, you know, with the guitar, you hit the whammy bar and that, you know, that fluctuation, that's a tremolo. Uh, and so where the name originally came from, was when we were first starting the company, uh, you know, we're an identity management company primarily. That, that's where we got our start. And uh, the very first product we were building was a web access management solution. So it was a, a you know, anybody familiar with Service Mesh will be familiar with this concept. It was a reverse proxy where you authenticated on the front end. And we're actually going to use Kerberos on the back end to, to lock down access, and we're going to be this universal reverse proxy. And we wanted to get away from agents, which is a big thing that our, our competitors were doing. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I wish I could say I was a Marving, uh, marketing maven, but I am not. Uh, the first uh, name for the company was going to be Auto IDM. Uh, simple, you know, kind of talked about what we did. And my co-founder, who actually is quite good at marketing, uh, came back and said, no, that's a terrible name. It, it's clunky. Now I'm going to think of something else. So he came back and he said, well, it's a web access manager, wham, whammy bar, tremolo security. And I was like, oh, that, that's a terrible name. Nobody's going to know what it means. You know, my, my, uh, my co-founder is, is a friend of mine from Boston, and uh, he's got a very thick Boston accent. He can't pronounce it correctly to save his life. Um, and I was like, ah, that's just not going to work. Go back to the drawing board. And so that night, uh, I spent a good three hours trying to find a domain name for the company that had the word identity in it. Um, I tried different languages. I tried different combinations, acronyms, everything. Couldn't find a thing. It's like, so uh, who is tremolosecurity.com? It's open. Cool. Now it's the name of the company. So then that's how uh, we got the name of the company and the guitar logo. Um and everything there. How, how long ago did you found the company? It must have been, what, four or five years ago, six? No, we ago? actually started the company in um, 2010 uh, was when the company originally started. And uh, we kind of flew under the radar somewhere between a hobby and a science project for a few years while, while we were kind of, you know, getting our feet under us, building out the technology. Um, and then in 2013, we got our first customer, uh, public safety uh, uh, environment here in the D.C. area, which kind of catapulted us. And then uh, we didn't really come out of like, a, a, not that we were ever really in stealth mode, but we didn't really start getting out there until uh, 2015, which is when we had our first booth actually at a Red Hat Summit. That was kind of a, our coming out, um, you know, coming out of stealth mode. Uh, party was that first booth at Red Hat Summit in 15 in Boston. And it's also when we became an open source company. We said, you know what? Open source is going to be the way to go. It's going to be the way to get to the most people. Um, and so we decided to go ahead and open source up, and uh, it's been off to the races since then. And before starting the company, you were where? So I was a consultant at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, so uh, if folks are familiar at all with the audit industry, they, they call it the big four, PricewaterhouseCoopers, which I was, Deloitte, um, Ernst & Young, KPMG. And so I was an identity management consultant there for, for uh, 
about seven years. Um, and if you name a, a vendor and an industry, uh, there's a pretty good chance I was involved with some kind of cross section of doing an identity management deployment there. Um, and so uh, what we found when we were doing these deployments was that we were spending a lot more time customizing this beautiful vendor demo to what the customer needed rather than actually implementing their business logic. So we, we would, you know, the, the, the vendor would walk in and say, here's this big, gorgeous demo with all our opinions of how you run your identity management. What's interesting about identity management versus um, a lot of other technical disciplines is it's very closely bound to the business. It, it's got to tie to the way the business is set up because often you're saying, okay, um, you know, our management process is a certain way or an organizational process is a certain way. Um, a lot of enterprises are very siloed organizationally, so your technology has to match that siloing. Um, and so we would spend most of our time kind of pulling that demo apart and reconstructing it in a way that would work for customers. Uh, and so this was before the term microservices, you know, really existed. Um, but we said, you know, the better way to do this is instead of building this monolith uh, you know, identity system that you then have to you know, pull pieces out and reconnect. Let's start from basics and build you know, what would today be described as microservices for identity management. So your web access management, your SSO, your virtual directory, your user provisioning, your APIs, your self-service, all those different things. And so we built that out. And what became really interesting was as we were building it out, um, it just meshed really well with the OpenShift and Kubernetes world because we had built these small building blocks that we said, okay, here's your Lego set. Here's a picture of what it could look like, but here are the 25 other designs that it comes with that you can do like when you buy Lego <laughs> sets, right? So, so here's your Lego set. Go ahead, build it however you want. Um, and it really, it really turned both the – uh, uh, implementation time on its head and the costs on its head. You know, one of the things, one of our rules of thumb was that your your ratio of professional services to licensing dollars is going to be two to one. For every dollar you spend on a license for software, you're going to spend two dollars to implement it. We wanted to turn that on its head, and we found that by going with a, a microservices like approach, a building blocks approach, um, our implementation times just bottomed out. And we were able to, you know, we had one customer, uh, as an example, we replaced a, 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 a long-standing legacy system that uh, um, took them, I think, three years to get implemented. We had the proof of concept up and ready to go in three days to replace them. And at that point, it was just provisioning hardware and applications and whatnot. So how have things changed since you started the company now with Kubernetes becoming mainstream and, and identity management in Kubernetes? What, what does that mean? So um, a lot has changed. Uh, we got started in Kubernetes back in the one three days, maybe one eight, whenever our back first came out and, and OpenShift uh, at first come out. In fact, we had a booth at the first KubeCon NA in Seattle four years ago um, when it was still small enough to be in a uh, hotel lobby. Um, <laughs> not, not small enough to do that anymore. Um, right. And so we, we actually originally got involved with OpenShift and then later with the upstream Kubernetes and with RBAC. And so uh, we started with, um, so when you go to the Kubernetes authentication page and it talks about OpenID Connect, we rewrote all that documentation and donated it back to Kubernetes. Um, we then went ahead and, and started to, to, sit, to look at the way OpenShift and Kubernetes deals with identity. You know, uh, one of the things that's really changed over the last several years is this notion of what goes into your cluster, and we're going to talk a lot about that during the demo. Um, you know, it's more than just Kubernetes. It's more than just OpenShift. Right. I mean, you, you, you've got you've got monitoring systems. You've got your GitOps system. We're going to talk about Argo CD today. You've got your build system. We're going to talk about Tecton. You got your uh, code system. You know, we're going to be using GitLab for that today. 
Um, and all of these systems have their own concept of identity. And so specifically when you're looking at like an enterprise world, most of the implementations are multi-tenant. You know, it's, it's most enterprises are looking for multi-tenant solutions. They're not, you know, uh, uh, most implementations I've seen that are where the tenancy is at the cluster, that doesn't scale real well from a management solution. It, it you know, it, it, there are advantages to it, and obviously you're going to have multiple clusters. Um, but when all is said and done, it, it, the management process of multi-cluster uh, doesn't scale when you're, you're trying to have a cluster per application. So multi-tenancy becomes really important. And so uh, identity is, you know, it's kind of like the force in Star Wars. It's, it, it binds everything together. You know, Argo CD has its own internal RBAC system. It doesn't work with Kubernetes RBAC system. It's got its own thing. Uh, GitLab has its own identity system. And then, of course, OpenShift and, and Kubernetes has its own identity system. So if you're going to provide a platform for your developers to be able to um, access these systems securely and, and to, to, you know, really get the IT people out of the room, to, out of the way, right? You know, the goal is, is that the people who own OpenShift are not involved day to day in applications, right? If, you know, one of the things in the identity world I always say is if I'm in the room, something's probably gone terribly, terribly wrong. You know, right. people can't log in, people are unhappy, you know. It should be the same way with the, the people who run the Kubernetes and OpenShift deployments. If you're running OpenShift or Kubernetes and you're in the room during an issue, something's gone really, really wrong. Ideally, your application owners are managing all that process. Um, so, speaking of being in the room, we have somebody else from your company here, Brian, and he's sitting there down in the bottom left corner of my screen. Um, Brian, who are you and how did you get involved with the company? Hey, great question, Mike. Thanks for uh, having us on this morning. Um, I go back 20 plus years in the identity access management space with some very large programs of record. The uh, early days were extremely challenging to enable access to uniquely different data repositories. It, suffice to say it was painful, time consuming and expensive. Many development hours had to be built into these projects. Fast forward to 2011, I met an innovator named Mark Borstein who had an answer for this challenge. He had started his own company, Tremolo Security. Most intriguing was his subject matter expertise, successful consulting background, and the fact that he had developed his own IP to secure the authentication process and speed the implementation phase. Huge game changer for organizations leveraging their existing infrastructure to deploy a solution in weeks, not months. This resonates with all organizations concerned with cost savings, dedicated IT resources, and securely enabled privileged access to their internal team, contractors, and partners. Okay, fair enough. Back to you, Mark. I couldn't help but notice when you were talking just a couple minutes ago that there was something in the background there, and I thought maybe I thought maybe you might want to talk about something that's exciting that's going to be coming out here. Is there a book coming out by any There point? is. I'm going to, I'm going to show off my, 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 my uh, the book cover here. I'm going to do a little bit of uh, shameless self-promotion. So I uh, co-authored a book uh, with, with my partner in crime here, Scott Sorovich, um, on enterprise Kubernetes. So uh, when, when we start talking about writing this book together, um, we found that there was a big gap uh, in the knowledge out there, the written knowledge, I guess, on, on how you implement Kubernetes between um, enterprises, which are really unique from, you know, kind of your more consumer-facing companies. You know, the, the, in enterprise, you know, you're not, you, you're, you're, you have to work around the organization as well. Um, you know, most enterprises, you might only have a dozen, maybe even less of these massive, truly enterprise-wide applications, right? Your ERP, your messaging, things like that. But then most of your applications are, um, 
these siloed systems be, that might have a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand users. And to the people who own it, it's the most critical application in the world. Uh, and so, uh, and, and they're now responsible for keeping it up and running and, you know, their paycheck depends on it, right? Their bonus depends on it. So we wanted to write a book with that in mind. So um, heavy focus on identity. So we, we have full chapter on authentication, RBAC authorization, pod security policies, and uh, open gatekeeper. And then a lot of the stuff that just you might think is kind of mundane, but is really important to managing that kind of a diverse environment, backups, logging, and, and log aggregation. Uh, and then um, what we're going to demo here was one of the most fun things I, I've done in a while. Our last chapter, we said, you know, we're going to build a platform. We're, we're, we're going to talk about how you build pipelines and then build a platform with the goal of not having to have, <clears throat> excuse me, not having to have a, a, um, a Kubernetes admin building these bespoke clusters. Everything's automated. Everything's done through through GitOps. Uh, and and uh, what you know what we we really wanted to 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 handle with this book was to say. Look, this book is more than just theory, right? It, it, a lot of books are, are theory, you know, and they give you great information, but it, it's not necessarily always um, in a practical context. Where you have cookbooks, which give you really specific recipes, they'll give you great ideas and great knowledge, but they might not relate directly to what you're doing. We wanted to kind of go in the middle where it's a practical book with a lot of theory in it. So the thing's huge. I think it's 650 pages of you know of kubernetes um and there are labs in most of the chapters that you can go through and and everything's open source it's up on github um and so we we had a blast it's coming out on november 6th uh and then anybody who wants to get their hands on it we have a uh, discount code uh we'll have it on the last slide we put up it's 25 kubernetes you go to amazon and order it there um you'll get a 25% discount. I just I just linked it in the uh in the chat as well, but we will have that up uh on the on the last slide as you said. Awesome. 650 some odd pages. Uh, I I can't wait to pull that down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's um it, it it can be used as a doorstop if you really don't want to read it. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, uh demo time. Can we yeah. can you show us something and and hopefully Hopefully, um, there's going to be lots of uh, terminal windows and manually editing config files or, or <laughs> prove me wrong. I promise we will not manually edit a single config file. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And everybody can see what's going on here. We've got a lot going on on this demo. Um, so when when we built that final chapter and we wrote the book um, building a platform i have a graphic where we automated the uh, deployment of um, uh, argo cd projects gitlab and uh, kubernetes projects and tecton so that they're all integrated um, and i made this diagram of all the different objects that we had to create and their relationships and this is just in one cluster because it was a book, right? It's not a production system. Uh, 20 plus Kubernetes objects. I think I had about 45 GitLab calls to create the various projects, forks, et cetera, um, and a handful of calls to Argo CD. Argo CD uh, has a combination of its own API, plus it's reliant on Kubernetes. There's some CRs in there to create all these relationships. And then you think about the automation part of it. Um, you know, you don't want to commit code to GitLab and then go into Argo and say, let's trigger a sync or commit code to GitLab and then, you know, run a, a CLI command to fire up a, a pipeline. You want everything to just happen. So in the background, that's all built on webhooks. So you got to create the webhook, you got to create the secret, you got to provision the secret, all these different things. It isn't rocket science, but there's just a lot of stuff to do. Uh, and so what we're going to show you is what the results of that are. Um, 
because it, it's it's one of those things that I could probably sit here for two hours and go through each little detail. Your audience will not enjoy that. All right, let's dive right into the demo. So we're going to show how we're going to uh, integrate Argo CD, GitLab, and OpenUSA and OpenShift so that you have one kind of seamless process. Um, as you're deploying your applications, you don't want to get your OpenShift team involved in having to set it up. So what we're going to do is we are going to uh, provision an application uh, through a self-service request, create all the objects in GitLab, create the objects in Argo, create the objects in Tekton, link everything together, and then we'll show the progression of how that all comes about. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to log in as my user. Now, uh, a lot of enterprises have SAML2. Um, if you don't have a testing identity provider to work with, we actually provide one. So it might be something that you're interested in. Uh, go to uh, Tremolo.io. So we're going to sign in as our user. And we're going to go ahead and create a new OpenShift application. Let's make sure that we get the right name. So we're going to submit the request. Now this is going to be different from like your, you might be used to like an email where you have to request access via an email that says, okay, um, uh, you know, email that says, okay, let, let's go ahead and, and, and do the email shuffle of, hey, can you create this project? And you get these bespoke clusters. We're going to avoid that. So let's go ahead and now that the request is in, uh, an admin would have gotten an email that says, hey, uh, there is somebody waiting on a request. We're going to log in as an admin user. And you'll see that we got this open approval. Here's the request that came in. So let's review it and approve it. Of course, this workflow can be customized however you need it. So we've submitted the request and take a look up here at the logs streaming through OpenShift. And you're going to start to see um, a lot of provisioning action here. There we go. So uh, when we wrote the book, uh, built this uh, uh, diagram to link all of the different objects we had to create. There were 20 plus Kubernetes objects that had to get created, um, probably about 40 GitLab API calls that were created, uh, the Tekton objects or Kubernetes objects, and then Argo CD has kind of a mix of uh, Kubernetes and its own API. You had to create all the webhook connections. So, you know, when you commit uh, some code into GitHub or into GitLab rather, you know, you want that to automatically trigger your workflow you, or your, your pipeline. You don't want to have to, to manually kick that off. Um, so that's going to take a, a minute to, to provision all those different objects. We're not just provisioning objects, we're creating SSH keys on the fly, we're creating secrets so that your webhooks can't get hijacked, all sorts of good stuff. Uh, so let's take a look here, see uh, where it is. Nope, we're, we're still provisioning, I think. Uh, nope, I, I think we have finished provisioning. And just to kind of prove my point of how many objects got created, oop, I actually didn't want to log out. Let's come over here, look at our audit report. So we're not just uh creating these things we're actually creating an audit trail so that way when it comes time to do an audit you can tie all that infrastructure we just provisioned back to a single request and who approved it so let's come down here to uh, our actual provisioning and you can see this is our new application here are all the objects that we created we created you know, bindings, role bindings, groups, all sorts of stuff um, that connects everything together so that this all works seamlessly. So now that we are uh, there, let's go ahead and log into Open Unison or into GitLab. And we're going to log in as our original user, MLBIM. Six.
And you'll notice that we just have a handful of projects here. We're also going to log into Argo. And we see the same projects here. So let's talk about these projects real quick. So uh, let's start here, up here. We have our application build. So this is where the source code goes. This is where our actual microservice or application, whatever it is, is going to go. Um, that does not have an Argo CD project. So that's just source code, right? Argo CD is purely for the operations side of things. Uh, so we're going to have a pipeline namespace or project. The pipeline project has all of our Tekton objects in it because there are webhooks, there's security you want, to keep that isolated. Uh, and so that project does in fact have a Argo project. And we can see here, there's a couple of stub objects that we create to support the webhook. We then have our operations project. So we have two operations projects. First operations project is our production project. And that also is linked to a Argo CD project. It's not a lot in there right now because it's an empty project. Additionally, oops, we have a dev project. Now what's important about the dev project is it is simply a fork of the prod project. So uh, when it comes time to move into production, what we're actually gonna do is do a merge request into the production repo and let Argo CD then go ahead and kick in and provision everything. So the first thing we're gonna do is we are going to check in our source code. So I'm gonna to go to the application and I'm gonna create a fork. And yeah, well, that's forking. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and check out our fork. Now let's go into our application. So nothing spectacular there. We've gone ahead and we've put some code into our fork of the application. So we're gonna put that on hold and come back to that. So next we're gonna to come to our operations code. So let's come to dev operations. We're gonna come here to our Argo project as well. Now, uh, there's not really anything in here. Now, in real life, you're gonna to wanna to fork this to do some work first, but for this demo, we're gonna keep it simple. So let's go ahead and clone that. And we're going to go ahead and copy our operations code. So what do we mean by operations code? Uh, we're talking about uh, deployment, right? Not, nothing, uh, um, nothing too crazy. Take a look at that in a second. So let's go ahead and push. And we push it into our dev repo. And in a few moments here, we can see that Argo CD is already on the job of syncing it in, but we got this little broken heart. That is because our repository points to a container that doesn't exist. So we take a look here and it doesn't have a tag on it. We gotta add that tag. So let's go ahead and do that next. So the next thing we're going to do is we need to check out our build. So this is actually going to do the work of building our code. So let's go ahead, copy that. And just to show what's going on, let's go into the build project. So again, we've got kind of our stubs here, but we got to build that out. We've got to add a pipeline. We've got to add bindings. We've got to tell it where it's going to push in for me, uh, the container to. So let's go ahead and do that now. And let's copy. All right, now let's take a real quick look to make sure that the, uh, I think it's the trigger 
template is pointing to Python test 11. Okay, good. All right, so now what's going to happen is we're going to add it. We're going to commit it. We're going to push it. So what's going to happen is our Tecton pipeline, and we'll talk a little bit about what that pipeline is doing, is being pushed into Git. At which point, there we go, Argo is picking it up and saying, yeah, let's go ahead and deploy all this stuff. So we want to wait until everything's green. So everything's being synced in. We now have a working uh, webhook in a build environment. So uh, let's go ahead and push some code, shall we? So we're going to go back to our fork of our application code. And to show you there's nothing up my sleeves, Right, no pipeline found. So let's go ahead and create a merge request with our dev operations code or with our uh, application code base. And part of that GitOps flow is once that's been submitted, GitLab says, okay, somebody's got to approve it and merge it. So once it's been merged, you can see almost immediately Argo CD is off to the races and starting to do its thing with a build. So let's take a look at our pipeline. Uh, what am I doing wrong here? Python test 11. There we go. So we're off and running. So let's go ahead and, uh, oops, pipeline run. Go ahead and watch this as it goes. So that's off to the races. And we have three tasks in our pipeline. The first one um, get generates an image tag based on a timestamp and also saves the uh, commit hash that triggered the build. Second one actually builds the container. So we're using Kaneko in this instance. That's a tool from Google, uh, very similar to Podman. Uh, same type of idea, building a um, uh, building a uh, image without having to have a daemon. And then finally, the last thing we're going to do is update our uh, dev repo. And in fact, if we come here, let's come over to dev. Uh, we're going to update our dev repo so that uh, we're patching, where's uh, dev, 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 there we go. So we can see here the updated commit. And what we did was we checked out the code from dev, the dev repo, and patched it with our timestamp. So now our, our, our image has a timestamp on it, and it also um, has the commit of the code that triggered the build. So we now have something to reference. Uh, and so if we take a look here and do a quick refresh, you can see that it's syncing and our dev instance has picked it up and now it's running the new pod. So this little broken heart is gonna go away here in a minute. Uh, so the, there was no API call, right? The, um, the pipeline checked out the code, made the update, pushed it back in. That was the final step. Uh, and all this requires a lot of automation because you need to build SSH keys out to do this, credentials, different things to do it um, that you, you don't want to be doing manually. You'll also notice so far I have not actually run the OpenShift command to do anything uh, other than perhaps look at some logs. So that's kind of firing up here. And we want to wait for the circle to, to finish and for us to be able to say, yep, it, it's running a... Uh, a good version of the pod and the broken heart has gone away. And what's really great about this is that um, something to point out is that I, as my application owner, can see everything that's going on. I don't have to get the OpenShift team involved. 
you know, I can monitor what's happening in Argo CD because I have secure access. And we can see down here, we're now at a green heart, the old one's gone. So uh, we're happy, everything's running. So let's go ahead and push this into production. So how do we push it to production? Well, it's GitOps, right? So let's go over to production. And there's an error because there's no source code. We can fix that, or there, there, there's no operations code. So let's go ahead and push this into production. So let's create a new merge request. We're going to create that merge request into production. Merge of dev. And we're going to commit the merge. So now Git is our source of truth for all changes to operations. We've done no commands in OpenShift. Everything has been external to OpenShift. And so we take a look here in prod, give it a second, and there we go. It's launching up and it's pulling down. And we can see that it's actually launching and we're all green. So we've gone the whole gambit, right? We went from requesting that an application be created, provisioning all the infrastructure automated. We went ahead and committed our code. A pipeline built everything and we didn't have to get the OpenShift team involved for any of it. Um, just to show you, there was nothing up my sleeve. I'm gonna go ahead and log out. And I'll show you here, we only have the Python test application, right? So let's log out here and let's make sure we're fully logged out. Now we're going to sign back into GitLab. This time I'm going to sign in as my super user. So you can see all the projects I have access to that my application owner didn't. That's because we're using the power of identity to know who has access to what, and to bind these different systems together. So we have test seven, four, two, you know, let's log in via open unison here. Here's all sorts of projects that, you know, the user doesn't care about. So, so we're not just leveraging automation, we're leveraging security to give you a better approach that is more hands-off for your team uh, and is far more satisfying for your customers. What does it mean for customers? So what's the, what's the business impact of identity management in a multi-cloud environment and, and what, you know, how does that affect the bottom line for customers? You know, the, the biggest effect for customers um, is the fact that they, the, their IT departments or, or their, the people who own their infrastructure don't have to get involved with the day-to-day -day of applications. Uh, so. A customer that I built a similar solution for, um, we went live uh, uh, about a year ago, and I hear from him once in a blue moon, a hedge fund over in the UK, um, small as these things go, I guess a small hedge fund is like $5 billion. Um, sure. And, you know, their, their developers wanted to be able to launch microservices. And so, uh, you know, but they, they, they didn't want to have to get the IT, you know, the, the, the infrastructure side of the IT department involved. So we set up a very similar solution for them where the, their developer would log in, say, create me a project. Now we based the permissions off of their active directory. So there was no request approval, but based on that, it provisioned out everything. It provisioned out the Git repos. It provisioned out the build systems. It provisioned out the namespaces. It tied everything together. And so the developers were then able to say, hey, I'm going to just go ahead and start pushing code. And we actually gave them a, a little button so that they could, you know, say, I'm going to push from Open Unison, from the Open Unison portal rather than from inside of, of Kubernetes. Um, and he's like, yeah, I, I don't get phone calls. I mean, that, that is one less thing that that guy has to manage because at the end of the day, we all have better things to do than building bespoke clusters for people. So it really becomes a, a force multiplier. People are happier because they're getting their job done. They're not complaining, oh, I don't have access to this. I don't have access to that. And really you're spending hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions, depending on the size of your organization on this automation solution. 
do you really want to manually onboard people? Um, it just, it, it doesn't work well. So it really becomes a big force multiplier there. Huh. You earlier in the, in the, in the discussion, you interchanged the words Kubernetes with OpenShift. And I would imagine that, that, that your, your technology and your solutions work on any Kubernetes based implementation, not just OpenShift. Is that correct? Sure. Yep. Yeah. But we have been working with you folks for years. You, you guys are a member of OpenShift Commons. You have a Red Hat certified operator for OpenShift, which means that uh, it's, it's gone through the Red Hat internal testing and blessing. So when customers want to use it, they know it's tried, tested, trusted, and they can get support uh, from, from Red Hat and your company at the same time. Um, so I did want to put that gratuitous plug in there. So thank you for thank I, you for doing I, that. It, it makes a it, it makes a big difference for customers when they want to go and run these things in production, right? Absolutely. I mean, we're 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 a security company, right? I mean, we go we're going to the CIO and saying we're going to help make your infrastructure more secure, and being able to say and we're certified on the platform that you're using. You know, we're, we're here in the DC area. You know, back in the before times when we used to go places, you go on the metro and there are signs everywhere. You know, 100% of uh, of government agencies run Red Hat Linux, right? That that's that's not hyperbole. That's true. Um, and and so in the enterprise, you know, being able to say, yep, this is certified on the platform that you're using. Uh, you know, we had to go through their rigorous process. They had to review it. We're also in the Red Hat marketplace. So um, that's an additional avenue to be able to get access to. But we have uh, we, we made big bets on OpenShift uh, very early on in our Kubernetes journey, and those uh, those bets have definitely paid off. So war stories. <laughs> Everybody loves a good war story. What you've been in the in the security business for quite a good quite quite a long time, um, both at your company and, and previously. Tell us. Tell us one of your favorite war stories that you've that you've uh, addressed. Um, so honestly, one of my favorite stories is actually before my time at Tremolo. It was, it was one of the inspirations for the way we approach infrastructure. Um, so while I was still with PwC, uh, I was on a project where we were helping a customer, a name brand that everybody's heard of and everybody's used, um, was migrating between different identity vendors. I was brought onto the project. I was told, look, you know, you have a limited number of hours to get this done. You know, 400 applications across six continents. Um, here are three or four developers in India. Just have them go and manually update the configuration. And I'm like, that sounds like a terrible idea. I don't want to do it. They're not going to want to do it. Um, and it's going to be error prone and all sorts of problems. So I said, look, I'm telling you, we can automate this. We're going to come in under budget. Customers are going to be happy. They're going to have a much better product, and they're going to have a much better time. And so got with the team in India, and, you know, there are always issues when you're dealing with different time zones and whatnot to, to be able to get that done. But, you know, we all were able to work together and build this amazing thing. And this was before DevOps. DevOps wasn't a, a word yet. Um, and so we were able to build this system that queried the APIs of the old system, you know, constructed out a, 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 a framework, tested the old system to make sure that that framework worked the way we thought it did, provisioned that then automatically into the new system, test the new system, and then turn it all on automatically. And, you know, the, the project went really, really well for the most part. Um, we did have one issue. We we accidentally turned off SAP in Japan, which didn't really go over real well. Um, no, I <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, we we fixed that pretty quickly. Um, but then uh, we we went ahead, and once we got that you know figured out, the original go date uh, we had to cancel because our product owner, our project owner from the customer, um, had to have an emergency. Uh, 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 Pendemectomy, append remove his appendix in an emergency. Appen appendectomy, I think. Appendectomy, there you go. Um, I'm not a doctor, but I do play. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, he said, no, I'm not, we're not going live with this without me being there. Okay, well, I was promised to another project, so I had to go, and they delayed 
the rollout three weeks. And uh, I got a phone call one day. It was like, yep, done. I was like, wait, really? Yeah. No, no bridge call? Nope. We threw the switch and everything just worked. And it's like, we came in under budget. We automated everything. People were happy with it. Of the 400 applications, I think we were able to automate like 395 of them. Um, and so that that was a big inspiration for for the approach that we ended up taking when we when we started Tremble and getting into the automation space. Hmm. You you mentioned early on here today when we first started talking that that you're not the marketing guy that that you're the you're you're the big brains you're you're the techie behind behind it all and that your other co-founder is more of the marketing genius of the company. He's not here today. What would he want you to talk about and bring up for the audience that you haven't covered? So what I'm trying to prevent is, is the second we end the show, you get a phone call from him, and he's like, why didn't you talk about X, Y, Z? So, Mark, right. here's, your op- here's your opportunity to, <laughs> to, to, to prevent that phone call from happening. Um. So I, I guess the biggest thing that I, I'd want to let people know is that, um, you know, everything I showed is not vaporware, right? It's real. Um, it, it, it's it's out there. We're constantly involved in the Kubernetes and OpenShift world. If you're asking questions on either OpenShift Commons or in the Kubernetes Slack channel, we're going to be there. And, and we're here to help. Um, you know, we, we are, we're experts. I'm a CKAD. Um, I, I went through that certification process. Um, you know, the, the, the dark, ugly truth of, of most enterprise software uh, is that the people who write this stuff never have to use it. We use our own software with customers. We're out there deploying it. We're making changes as customers need it. So we're not just building in fluff features that nobody's going to use. We're building features that people are actively using, actively need. Um, and so as you're kind of going through that journey of, of figuring out how you're going to automate your infrastructure, think about Tremolo security. Think about how you're going to automate your, uh, your infrastructure with security in mind. Okay. So your book's coming out on, would you say, November 4th, correct? November 6th. November 6th, okay. And we have the 25% discount code that's going to be available for any of the of the use of the listeners from the show it's here. It's good today. in the US only until uh, November 15th. Um, what I will say, because I know a lot of folks, uh, especially in the open source world, care very much about these things, is that if you do go direct to the publisher once it's available, um, it's DRM free. I'm sorry, if you broke up. It's what? It's uh, DRM free if you go directly to Packet, who's the publisher. Oh, okay. Well, I linked it in the chat for those people that are on the bridge here. Why don't we go ahead and put that up on the screen so everybody sure. else who is not here with us today, who's going to be watching this later on, can, can get that Someone URL. Oh. Um, and of course, you can find us on Twitter. Um, you know, our GitHub repo where we have all sorts of fun stuff, um, even beyond identity. So you might end up running into, uh, uh, you know, we have like an SMTP black hole that we keep updated. Um, that's really useful. We hope you all the best with the book. I think I will obviously be pulling down a copy using my 25% discount code. Where are we going to see you next? Or, you know, in this in this world with everything is virtual these days, we're not going to see you physically in person at Commons or the Red Hat Summit, but, um, you know, where can we see you next? Uh, so actually, um, I'm going to have the great pleasure of giving a lightning talk at the KubeCon NA virtual uh, security day. I'm going to be talking about why you should be using OpenID Connect with your clusters and not certificates for authentication. So that'll be my but, next kind of big thing. That's, uh, was that November 17th, right? 17th yep. and 18th? Uh, I think the, sec- yeah, I think 17th is the uh, uh, security day conference. Oh, that, on that, the 18th. that's a, a co located event, correct? It's, it's before yep. KubeCon starts? Okay. Yep. Good. Well, I would like to say on behalf of everyone here on the OpenShift Commons briefing hour that um, yeah, would really 
appreciated having you join us here today. Um, I think um, we'd love to have you come back again. When's your next book coming out? We'll, we'll bring you on. <laughs> Sounds great. And thanks so much for having us, Mike. Okay, great. Well, thanks, everybody. I hope that, uh, hope that this was informative and useful. You can tune in every Wednesday at noon Eastern time, and we have a full lineup of software partners booked out all the way. I think we're booked all the way into March at this point. So all of our software partners with Red Hat certified operators for OpenShift are going to be here on the show talking about their technology, their products, their war stories, and hopefully some more books. Thanks again, Mark, and we are signing off for the day. Thanks for joining.